Thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Just want to say good afternoon. Thank you for coming to my presentation. It's been a while since I've presented, so please, please be kind. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for coming here, for all, well, first of all. Um, so we can move on to the overview here. Because of super. Maybe not. There we go. So the overview, we're going to go over what the water use assessment unit is all about. That's my unit. Um, I've been working there for about two and a half years, and I started in November uh, 2019. Um, before that, I worked at Whiteman and Associates as an um, uh, environmental scientist and a surveyor. I don't know how I became a surveyor, but they needed somebody. Uh, we're going to cover the Great Lakes Compact and how it uh, pertains to my program. Um, part 327 summary, just what 327 is, and also how it pertains to my program. The water withdrawal assessment tool, which is a software that we're not software, it's more of an pro online program that we use to determine, um, to determine uh, water withdrawals for large quantity water withdrawals, how much water it's taking out of the watersheds and the water management areas, and its effect on uh, surface water as well as groundwater. Um, site specific reviews and other watt registrations, those are just the two types that we, uh, two types of registrations that we have. Um, and they both get dealt with a little bit differently, and I'll go into some uh, more detail on that. Water use reporting um, at the end of the year, how often or how much water they used in a given calendar year, uh, depending on the type of withdrawal. Water management areas and how they're different from watersheds because they're two different things. And the Water Use Advisory Council, which is an independent board of stakeholders um, from all different uh, walks of life that pertain to water usage and how it affects um, the state of Michigan and as well as coming up with recommendations for the legislature and uh, creating new laws uh, pertaining to water use. <clears throat> so the, the mission of my program, number one is to register large quantity water withdrawals, collect annual, annual water use data. Um, that's just for industrial and commercial because uh, agricultural is different. That's covered by MDARD, but we kind of work together on that. To, uh, we, we work together to make sure that uh, users aren't using more than they're authorized you know, because that would cause an adverse resource impact in the different water management areas. Uh, making determinations of potential impacts of water resources as a result of proposed withdrawals. Again, that's why we um, register them to make sure that they know how much they're supposed to use. And we also usually give them a schedule. Um, processes water withdrawal permits. So your large quantity water withdrawal permits that are over um, a million gallons per day, usually dewatering projects. Sometimes it will be, uh, type one public water supply systems, usually for a municipality. And compliance for qualifying a large quantity water withdrawals, that was my job, I'm a compliance analyst. <clears throat> um, just making sure that we go through uh, the registrations that have been installed, making sure that they were installed as they're authorized. And we also regulate part 327, our governing statute. So the Great Lakes Compact was signed into, uh, into law in 2008, it includes eight it includes eight states in the United States, as well as two provinces of Quebec and Ontario. So we kind of kind of share responsibility on that. Um, <clears throat> it prohibits diversions outside the Great Lakes Basin. So basically, if you have a, a user who wants to transfer the water from, uh, let's say, Elgin County, they want to transfer Elgin County, they want to build a pipeline for some reason down to Missouri. That's not allowed. You can't. There's no diversions. Um, prevent ad for adverse resource impacts, and that is just making sure that the, the resource that we have doesn't uh, go down in a manner that's going to affect fish, fish populations and to a smaller extent as well, residential wells and things of that nature. Um, each member state and province must regulate its internal water use. Again, that's why I have a job. That's my job in the state of Michigan um, to make sure that people are being responsible with their water use and they're not taking advantage of it or breaking the law. Um, surface water and groundwater interconnected parts of a single hydrologic cycle. And I think that most of you here have probably seen the hydrologic cycle. It rains, it runs off into the streams, some of it goes into the groundwater, some of it goes into the air, some of it gets used. Um, part 327 is the statute to administer the compact. Again, that's the governing statute for my, my program. And most of the decisions we make are based on what is in that statute. And this is just a picture of the uh, Great Lakes Basin. As you can see, we've got our, we've got our five Great Lakes here. Um, and they all have a different uh, boundary. And you can see it's pretty far reaching. And um, everybody within this, all the different states and things like that, including Indiana for some reason. I'm kidding, just kidding. 
they all have a part to play in it. Each state has their own uh, way to regulate it. Uh, it's regulated in different ways depending on the state. Um, Michigan and Ontario are probably the two most strict, but they also have the most coastline uh, for all of these. So they have a little bit harsher rules or harsher punishments. I'm sorry, not punishments, harsher penalties for violations of this. Um, and they do, I mean, a, a lot of times they will go after these people that are breaking the law. Um, yeah, so that's that. Part 327, so I'm just gonna give you a quick overview here because there's a lot to part 327. Where it says baseline capacity, basically it's like anything that was um, installed for Eagle, not for MDAR, this is different. Uh, April 1st of 2009, anything prior to that and they had uh, reported water use for that withdrawal is basically grandfathered in. So if someone has a 500 uh, gallon per minute irrigation well out in their field that they've been operating since the 90, 80s or 90s and they reported their water use before that date, they are grandfathered into 500 gallons per minute. Now, if they wanted to adjust that up to 700 gallons per minute, they would have to register it with us for anything above that 500 gallons. So they'd have to register for the 200 gallons per minute, which is good because that would, that, it's a less of an impact on the watersheds. <clears throat> and I just covered that. Newer increased withdrawals of uh, 10,000 gallons per day, which is like 69.85 gallons per minute, which gives you 100,000 gallons per day if you run it 24 hours. Um, anything greater, 70, 70 gallons per minute or greater, pumping capacity does have to be registered. There are caveats, but they're incredibly rare. Um, that also includes if you have a bunch of wells on the same property that add up to 70 that meet all the other criteria. So if you have six 50 gallon per minute wells, that's 300 gallons per minute, they all still need to be registered. You can register them all under one. <clears throat> um, yeah, new and increased, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Site-specific reviews, I'll get to a little bit later. Alternative analysis is also with uh, SSRs. Uh, newer increased withdrawals of greater than two million gallons per day require a permit. So that would go, that would, it's a permit, usually costs about $2,000. It goes to my colleague, Andy LeBaron. He does a review on it to make sure that the watersheds and the water management areas can handle that. Um, a lot of times, like I said, the big ones like that are generally either, um, uh, type one municipal wells, they, so they're, they're providing water for a lot of people. Um, big dewatering projects, so if they're gonna put like a new sewer main in a place that has really high groundwater, they would, uh, they would use, uh, they'd apply for a withdrawal, like I said, it's a $2,000 permit, so we take it pretty seriously. Um, prohibiting, prohibiting diversions, again, making sure that water does not go outside the basin and prohibits adverse resource impacts. Again, that has to do with uh, fish populations and um, using the water to a point where it starts to affect fish populations and tributaries that lead to the, uh, the main branches of the main watersheds, like your Kalamazoo River, your Grand River, your Manistee River. <clears throat> so the water withdrawal assessment tool is one thing that we use. It's one of the tools that we use to see if uh, withdrawal is going to if a withdrawal is going to uh, create an uh, adverse resource impact or an ARI uh, in a, any given watershed. And we use fish populations as a gauge to that. So if they, uh, if they see year over year fish populations declining or um, uh, uh, some streams could be going dry or if they have too much water because in Michigan right now water levels are high. That doesn't mean that there's a lot of water available. It's a very weird dichotomy. And when the limit is reached, no further change or degradation of the stream system and no new withdrawals are allowed. We have actually uh, denied people water use plenty of times. They, they put uh, these withdrawals in places that really don't have any water left on paper. And some of these places on paper, they have water left, but there's not really, a, there's, there's issues with stream flow. There's issues with uh, surface water heights. Um, and I know that you guys probably all, all heard about, uh, what was that Wixom Lake with the dam collapse? Yeah, that's, that's caused some problems for us, but not nearly as much for those poor people. And the watt limitations. Um, <clears throat> the tool cannot assess potential impacts of newer and increased uh, large capacity wells drawdowns, so neighboring wells. Um, it doesn't take into account the, uh, the cone of depression when you turn your water on, if it's going to affect neighbor residential wells. There's no way to know that. It's too geologically complicated. Um, when installing new and large capacity well owners, or sorry, new and large capacity wells, owner and owners and operators should consider those potential impacts, and that's why we have 
the processes that we do, like with the site-specific reviews. Um, so we just consider it a part of doing business. If you're going to be taking, uh, taking that risk and putting it in a withdrawal, that's why you register beforehand so we can tell you if there's a good chance that something bad's going to happen so you're not spending $15,000 on a 12-inch well that you can't use. And so this graphic here, um, this just shows you the watt registrations. Um, so all those little dots are watt registrations. So we have about 7,000 total. Um, for some reason, the water withdrawal assessment tool, when it was first created, it went from one to 1,000, skipped 1,000, started up at 2,000. We don't know why. I don't know why I wasn't here. That was like in 2010. Um, some of these registrations are canceled, expired, or not yet installed. We do have quite a few um, registrations at this point that um, are, are SSR site-specific reviews. Uh, those usually we get done in 10 business days. We have that. That's part of the statute is to get them done, either to give them a thumbs up or thumbs down. But yeah, 7,000 is quite a few. And that's of, oh yeah, that's of yesterday. And this right here graphic is just, uh, it's just to show you the uh, watt registrations by county. And as you can see, Southwest Michigan is really heavily agricultural. That's where we have a lot of our problem watersheds. Um, that's where we have issues with site-specific reviews, SSRs. We have an issue passing them because the water, qual the water quantity just isn't there. Um, Cass County is the, oops, Cass County is the biggest issue. They have the most, 784 registrations. And I do believe 615 of those are in operation. The rest of them are either canceled, uh, denied, or um, yes, sir. Um, Not at all. Yeah. So Montcalm County, it, it, yeah, that, that one does stick out to a lot of people. And one of the big reasons too, you have Kent County that's it's pretty urbanized. There's not a whole lot. Most of the ones in Kent County are like irrigation wells for like uh, sports stadiums and they're usually not very large. Montcalm County, they produce a lot of potatoes, and potatoes are, you know, they're really, really thirsty plants. Um, but I've, I noticed that too when I first started here. I'm like, okay, we've got a bunch in Montcalm County. We don't have anything in Muskegon, what's going on? But yeah, and then like in the UP, it's really, I mean, most of these like, some of these places don't have any at all. Um, and that's because there's no agriculture there. It's not really arable. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of bedrock and poor soils and um, the drainage is pretty crazy. <clears throat> and so this, is, this, this, this graphic is about a year old. We couldn't compile it right now because we have some, we have some stuff in process right now. But uh, you can see that about a third, about a third of our registrations are site-specific reviews. And those are the ones that actually have to go to our staff geologists and to myself to do the compliance review on the water management areas. And uh, like I said, those generally take 10 days, sometimes less time. We had some SSRs because of the complications and the owner's not giving us the information that we need or dragging their feet. Sometimes they can go for months. They can be in limbo for months, which is unfortunate. <clears throat> and so registering for a, a large quantity water withdrawal. Uh, these are just the, the steps you'd wanna take. Accurate information is really, really key. So the majority of my job for my first two years here was going through the backlog of uh, hundreds or a couple thousand registrations and getting them up to date with how they're actually being operated. So the biggest sticking point in my job is reconciling what was authorized versus what was installed. And if they install it different than authorized, we have to, re we have to rerun the watt to see if there are any issues. Sometimes there are issues where they're depleting way more than they're supposed to be doing. What we do then normally is we, we talk to them, see if we can work out a deal. If they tell us to pound sand, then we send a violation notices, we, and then we put them on the compliance track if they don't wanna, yeah, if they don't wanna act right. And one of the big things that really bothers me is a lot of people forget to put comments down as to what they're using it for, so that way when we look at it 10 years from now, we'll know, okay, they're using it for corn and soybeans, or they're using it for landscaping, or they're using it as a, uh, a drinking water source, something like that. And so this is just the process. This is the website, the Watt, um, the public facing one. And this is just the, the way you do it. Um, assess a new withdrawal. If you have a current withdrawal and you want to change the parameters, uh, say you're a well driller in the field and you realize that you can't get 500 gallons per minute, so you want to change it to 300 because that's what it's producing. That's what the well is yielding. You can go on here or you can give me a call and you can uh, modify it. 
you can replace an existing withdrawal or you can do a new one. Um, but when you're in the field and you have problems, you want to modify it so that way, two years from now, because sometimes it takes a long time for us to find it, that uh, we're not going to have to go back and ask all these questions in the future, and maybe they're doing something they're not authorized to do and they're causing an adverse resource impact. <clears throat> and this is just the way you do it. You put the lat long in to where you want to, to, where you want to install the, uh, the well. Um, I, li I like people to get as close as they can to where they want to put it. Sometimes there's an issue because the location of the well can dictate, if it's, if it's close enough to the stream head, the Kohner depression is going to affect that stream or other streams in, uh, in a bigger way. And so yeah, you put that, that in right there. So this is actually my grandfather's house. I just use his stuff for, because, yeah. So you put it right there, yeah. You put your little uh, crosshair on there and this thing pops up. So this tells you what types of withdrawal you're gonna be using, if it's a surface water withdrawal, groundwater, or shallow pond. So a surface water withdrawal, usually they're gonna be out of like, your, like the drains along the fields, or a river, or sometimes even a lake. Um, those ones, they do affect the surface water more because they're taking directly from the stream, they're not taking from groundwater, which does take time to go down if you're taking groundwater with the Kona Depression and the, uh, the aquifer uh, recharge. Um, your groundwater, it's just a well. It's usually a well, you know, anything deeper than 20 feet. And then you have a shallow pond. These ones are a little more rare just because they're harder to, um, they're harder to regulate. Um, a shallow pond that's lined is a little bit more difficult. If it's lined and it's not, uh, directly, with, it's not directly taking from groundwater, it's, it's almost, it's a, lot, a lot of times these things are exempt. Now, if it's not lined and it's just sitting there, and it's you know, rising and falling with you taking it off, or rain or evaporation, then we treat it more like a surface water, but they're kind of a pain in the butt, and I don't like them very much. <clears throat> and so the, these factors right here are what's going to dictate how, you're, uh, how much water you're taking out of the watershed at any given time. The biggest one, the biggest one is the uh, pumping capacity, and then your well casing depth. So the deeper you go, the less impact you're going to be having on surface water. So if you're in a hard area where you can't, you know, if you, you, want to, you want to put an 80 foot well in, but it's just not passing the watt, it's not passing the tool, you go 300 feet, it might not affect it at all. <clears throat> and then another big one is the, uh, the pumping schedule. And so this, I just put on here, this is just a standard one that we, that we suggest to people, four days a week, 12 hours a day, June, July, August, because those are usually the driest months. And that's not to say that they have to adhere to this, it just gives them a number it gives them like what their total uh, annual withdrawal is going to be. So this one right here, the way that I have it, the way that things are set up, I think it's about 18 million gallons a year, which is a pretty standard thing for an 80 acre field. So, <clears throat> and um, so the ARI zone graph, depending on what type of stream classification it is, there, there are, I think there are either nine or seven, they just changed it. Um, it can be A, B, C, D, or it could be a B and D, depending on what type of system it is. Like a cool transitional stream, um, those ones are a little bit more difficult. There's no A and no C, it's B to D. So as soon as it, it, they're a lot more difficult to deal with. They're usually smaller watersheds. Um, but yeah, anything A, B, C is fine. Those, are all, those all will all pass the, um, the, the water withdrawal assessment tool. Anything in a zone D is gonna go to a site-specific review. And this is what it looks like when you, this is the withdrawal report before you register. It just tells you how much you're going to be using total annual withdrawal. And it gives you your Latin long. So like I said, they need to install it as close as they can to that point. Do you have a question? Oh, okay. And then you register it. Again, this is my dead grandpa. He used all of his information. I don't think he's gonna mind. Um, and like I said, put comments in there. If you, if you guys ever come across this, you probably won't. But put comments in there just to let us know if there's extenuating circumstances, like actually we're gonna move the well over here, we changed our minds, things like that. And then there are two types of registrations. There's an auto pass registration that will pass the tool with no problem. So there's enough water in the watershed, the conditions and uh, installation parameters are gonna be fine. They're not gonna cause an adverse resource impact. So those are the easy ones. And I like those, those ones are, I don't have to deal with them so much. Now the site specific reviews are withdrawals that will not pass the water withdrawal assessment tool and they will have to go to our staff geologists and the other staff to do some research, do some uh, geologic work, uh, look at well logs and things of that nature to make sure it can pass. 
and I covered half of that, so I'm sorry. So yeah, SSR staff will geologic and hydrologic uh, data. So if there's data from um, test wells in the area, they'll look at all of the different, uh, like the soil strata on well logs to see what, we're, what, uh, what type of soil transmissivity there's going to be given the geology that's on well logs. And I know that some of you guys here probably feel, uh, feel the EHSs and you know those well logs are really tenuous at best. Um, the stream index flow is basically um, how much water, when the, tool, when the tool first started, how much water was available in the watershed. Um, for better or for worse, some watersheds just don't, they just don't have that much. They're, they're too small or their geology is, uh, prohibits uh, there being a lot of water. That's just how it is. Um, withdrawal parameters may be altered during, that's what I was talking about earlier. If you uh, alter it and it's installed differently, you need to give us a call or you could be violating without even knowing it. And an applicant can, could submit additional data or submit an alternative analysis. And so an alternative analysis is, uh, it's kind of like a, it's like a way around the, uh, the, the statute that we have. And the, our clients, the, you know, the farmers or, or the construction people or their consultants will hire a, a usually a geologist or a hydrogeologist to do an alternative analysis on the, uh, on the watershed in the area. And um, they will submit their findings to us. And um, so we have, there's a 25 day deadline. So when they submit their study to us, if we don't get it uh, passed within 25 days or we don't address it in 20, within 25 days, then it's automatically authorized, which again, that's a backdoor to the law. Annual water use reporting. There are two types of those as well. Agricultural users generally will submit their uh, water use reporting to MDARD because they're agriculture. So Abby Eaton at MDARD, bless her soul, she has that hard job. Um, and it's usually April 1st of every year for the, for the uh, prior year. So in 2022, you'd be submitting your water use for 2021. And for industrial, commercial, and non-agricultural water users in general would go to my unit, to Andy. Um, that's also a difficult job. And it's the same, April 1st of every year. Um, so we have the total water use for 2019 because the 2020 numbers were never published for some reason. <clears throat> and this is just water use in general. Um, you see the majority of it is, is electric power generation in Michigan. That shouldn't be, come to a, as a surprise to anybody. But then you have um, industrial use, public water supply. The weird thing is agricultural doesn't look that much, does it? And there's a reason for that because that's consumptive water use. That's almost 40%. Um, it's, it's a big chunk and that's why we're regulating it so heavy. We also have the electrical power generation, the consumptive use. So um, it's a large portion of the large quantity water withdrawals uh, that doesn't return to the watershed, either through evaporation or it's transported out of that watershed into a different one or the, with the bottled water, it's to a different place entirely, but that's, that's exempt in the law. So, um, and there is, so with the electrical generation, there is a little bit of usage. There's a little bit of consumptive use that, uh, that goes along with it. It doesn't all go back. A lot of it's through evaporation. And these are the water management area boundaries. So the difference between a water management area and a watershed, the watershed the big, is the big picture. So you have like the Kalamazoo watershed. I believe, I think there are 40 water management areas along the Kalamazoo River. I think, yeah, I think there are 40. But all these little water management areas have their own tributaries, they have their own geology, and the way that they're impacted by the water users, that's, that's what we do. We see how the uh, water withdrawals and all of these watersheds, how they affect the tributaries that lead into the main water, watersheds. <clears throat> yes, sir? Your water management areas, um, are those also, would those be sub-watersheds? Yeah, they're sub-basins basically, yeah, sub-watersheds. We just call them water management areas because that's how it's written in the statute. Yeah. It's like how they spelled marijuana with an H for some reason and all the, uh, the new laws. I don't understand that either, but because they're, they're people who aren't gonna be regulating it, it just sounds really good. And so um, this, this is gonna change really soon, but we, these are some of the depleted water management areas that we have um, that we're really, really working on. The biggest one, the one that I've been into a lot isn't really up here, that's because we found a problem really early and we were able to keep it. So it's the, water, it's the Pigeon River watershed up in Ottawa County. There's no, water, there's no water left in that watershed, but it's not in the negative. It's sitting at a nice round zero, and we're trying to keep it that way because it's a pain in the butt. <laughs> but the rest of these, we've got um, 
So we've got Dickinson Creek here in Battle Creek in Calhoun County. Um, there's, uh, in, the, in the next slide I'll show you how bad they are. It's, it's been an ongoing thing. Um, there were a lot of illicit water withdrawals, so stuff that we had to do like after the fact, which is another type of registration and after the fact, which could trigger a, uh, a site-specific review or it could just be an auto pass depending on the watershed. But there were a lot of illicit uh, withdrawals, which is not surprising. People just put wells in without registering them because they didn't know or they didn't want to. Um, and then we have the one here in Hillsdale and Jackson counties. Um, we've been collecting uh, stream flow measurements. So we go out in there and the different tributaries that are leading to the main branch and we take, uh, we take uh, miscellaneous stream flow measurements to get an idea, to get some evidence that there might be an adverse resource impact occurring. Um, it's really difficult to prove that a single user is the one who's creating the ARI. But uh, in that case, if someone, if, it, if an ARI is occurring, um, the water users in each, each of the water management areas, they can all get together and they can discuss it. They can do a water use, uh, a water users group. And I, we haven't had one yet. None of the farmers have taken it upon themselves or water users have taken it upon themselves to create one. They'd all get together and discuss what the problems are and hopefully come up with a compromise. But I don't know how that would go, depending on the area, I suppose. <clears throat> but it always did surprise me that in West Michigan, there are only, in the really heavy areas, there are only three that are, that are uh, problem watersheds, but that is about to go up. 2022 is a, is a big year for site-specific reviews, so people are trying to get water out. <clears throat> and these are the depleted watersheds that you saw on that map there. So the south branch of Kalamazoo River in Hillsdale and Jackson, that one and Pigeon River, ones we're doing miscellaneous stream flow measurements in. Uh, some of these are depleted and they're in the negative right now just because there are site-specific reviews ongoing. So as soon as the registration gets submitted, the uh, water on paper already comes out of the watershed. And we do that first come first serve basis so that way people aren't all applying at once vying for the same water. And when they all get past, there's no water there for them to have. Uh, but this one right here, is, it's, been pretty, it's been pretty tough. It's, there's, there's already negative numbers. It's confirmed that there are negative numbers. Um, Dickinson Creek's the same way. I don't know much about Whit Whitmore Drain. That one's fairly new. Um, and Osborne Drain and Van Buren and Cass. Uh, that one is also negative because of an SSR, but they, they want to do an, I think they want to do an alternative analysis on that to see if they can get it to pass, but we'll see. And the Water User Advisory Council, that's what I was talking about earlier. There's a group of stakeholders. So we've got people from Trout Unlimited, Ducks Unlimited, uh, Farm Bureau. We've got a couple of well drillers. Um, we've got uh, Frank Edwagizak. He's the, the tribal liaison for the, the tribes, you know, the, the, all the, the sovereign land in, in Michigan. He's a really great guy. We've got a couple people from Eagle. Um, my boss is actually, he, he's not on it, but he moderates it. And we get together every two months and there, we discuss the topics of the day. Um, and there are, there are a couple, there are, I think there are four, five, there are five subcommittees too with different topics that they meet regularly to discuss issues. And then we all come together and decide what we should talk about, what we should move forward with. And their, their biggest thing is creating recommendations for the legislature for different laws, to change the laws, to change part 327, or to create new laws to help regulate water use. It can be, it can be uh, you know, a little combative at times because these people really care. That's why they're part of this group. And um, I, get to, I get to play a tech boy for them instead of all the computers. <clears throat> and they advise the legislature and state agencies. Um, they comply with the Open Meeting Act for transparency. So all of our water use advisory council meetings, they are all public. And if anybody in the state of Michigan wants to come and look at or watch them, they, they totally can. It's, it's entirely up to you. They're, they can be pretty cool. We get some, uh, some 3D groundwater modelers in. We get some hydrogeologists from state, uh, U, uh, MSU. We get some people from Wisconsin, from Minnesota. A lot of people that are in the uh, Great Lakes compact, uh, compact area. Um, we, 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 meet, uh, we meet with Wisconsin pretty often. They have a pretty good program and we're gonna try to make some changes based on stuff that they're doing. And they do a biennial report to the legislature every two years. A report has to go to the legislature, to one of the committees in Congress at the state of Michigan. And the first biennial report was presented in December of 2020, which had the, these are the recommendations that they had. Um, and then the underneath here, the data collection, that's one of the subcommittees, the modeling subcommittee. Then we have the planning subcommittee, the leadership committee, and the new topics committee. So these, these are some of the things that they put in there. 
And these are the staff. These are my, my colleagues, bless them. So before I worked there, before I got uh, hired in 2019, there were only like four or five people in the program. They've been building for a long time. That's why we had such a backlog. But um, I'm really, I'm honored and privileged to work with these people.